Uh, so hello everyone. Um, so um, sorry, <laughs> I messed up already. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking um, about um, bisexual visibility um, and some of the uh, some of the difficulties and complexities around um, visibility and some of the ways that it's already been talked about and some of the ways that we can kind of um complicate or add some complexities to the way that we talk about visibility so um firstly i'm going to kind of deconstruct the narratives of um passing and invisibility uh and i'm going to be weaving through um qualitative data on um from my PhD work, which looks at by plus men and their partners lived experiences of um, prejudice and relationships. Uh, and then hopefully we will arrive at a kind of um, more complicated conceptualization or something that encapsulates more complexity of the lived experience of by visibility um, with the kind of things that I'm going to be introducing. So uh, first, the, I want to talk about passing and passing is kind of um happens in in two ways so there's a kind of accusation which is often um from the lesbian and gay communities towards bisexual people um that bi plus people are kind of like free from stigmatized uh lesbian or gay experiences and that they're kind of like passing as straight basically um so i've got a quote here from one of my participants terry who's 25 um who says that they feel uncomfortable if they go to events such as pride and stuff like that because we appear we present like a straight couple um but passing doesn't just mean passing is straight um it can also be a kind of um tactic for managing stigma within uh queer social spaces as well um, so this is pretty well in, like illustrated by this quote from Elliot, who's a 28 year old man. Um, I'm just going to be reading the quotes out. Um, so I used to be part of a rugby team, like an inclusive rugby team, a gay men's rugby team, and uh, they're all very assumed gay. I just think they find it weird if, say, I turned up and I was like going on a date with a woman or talking about fancy a woman, they'd be like, "What? Go away!" Um, like you're not a part of our crew anymore um so we can see that like passing is as a narrative um is largely from um lesbian and gay sort of um social circles and that's something that's used to kind of that's like a, an accusation that's sort of leveled against bisexual people but the counter narrative to this is one of invisibility um so that is the idea that it's not that bisexual people are passing as anything it's that they're actually erased by essentially the heterosexual matrix so that's i'm talking about uh judith butler which i won't get into too much uh judith butler's idea of the heterosexual matrix um but it's this idea of um you can only have this like dichotomous understanding of uh of gender and therefore of gendered partner choice but also, um, in addition to this, um, if we only think about relationships as monogamous, then you can only be, you know, in a, you know, in a straight relationship or in a gay relationship or a lesbian relationship. So um, uh, there's a couple of kind of quotes which illustrate the the sort of heterosexual matrix. The first one, um, Sven, a 19-year-old participant, is talking about his mum and uh she's kind of like well you're either gay and you're straight you're either gay or you're straight and that's it um and then there's this quote from elliot as well uh who's the previous participant who's in the rugby team um who says that people think i'm gay um people know that i've got a boyfriend but they don't know that i'm bi so visibility as a narrative is that essentially bisexuality can never be visible in a monosexist heteronormative framework so um bisexuals are kind of always rendered completely invisible underneath this framework and i think both of these narratives are are problematic 
So it's wrong to assume that every like bi person is either stigmatized against or is stigma free. Like life is simply just more complicated than that. Um, there's varying levels of prejudice and privilege that people experience, you know, even on a day to day basis. So um, and bi people might pass, but maybe not consciously or strategically. But who would really blame them if, you know, or blame us if we did? Um, the problem is sexual prejudice, and it's not necessarily passing as something. Um, but we also can't ignore that the, in some respects, um, being kind of invisible is advantageous. So, you know, um, not having uh, our sexuality read as queer, you know, can keep us safe in some ways. Um, but also the narrative of invisibility is something that essentially renders bisexual subjects as people without agency who are oppressed, who are oppressed no matter what they do, um, which kind of isn't the case either. Um, so um, there's a kind of, there's a couple of like important ways that we can look at um, bisexuality in in a kind of uh, in a kind of more interesting way and um, will help to kind of bolster the visibility of bisexuality. So we can kind of maybe look at it through the lens of polyamory, um, but not all uh, bi people are poly, um, but polyamory does go some way to kind of deconstructing this idea that, you know, you just have one partner and that partner fulfills everything and, you know, that you're um, only attracted to that person. and um, polyamory complicates that and says no this is like a you know or non-monogamy generally um like this shouldn't be the compulsory state of affairs you should be free to have multiple partners if you want and if everybody consents to it um but um as i said before not all bi people are poly so this is kind of like limited in how we talk about broader by representation um and visibility uh so um if we instead think about kind of taking a kind of bird's eye view of sexuality um, and looking at it as something that happens like as a pattern of something that happens over the life course, um, then this might be a better way of looking at how bisexuality can be, you know, can be made more visible. So this quote is kind of long, but it kind of it illustrates quite well. What I'm talking about. So, um, Alex says um, someone who's bisexual might have like I don't know a string of four people of the same gender. Um, that is their romantic. That is their romantic interest. But that doesn't particularly mean that they're only interested in that gender. But a lot of people might be very quickly like, yeah, but I mean, obviously you've only got girlfriends and everything like that. You've only got boyfriends and everything like that. It kind of misses the idea of what's actually happening in real life, and that. Bisexuality means 50-50, one or the other. You should have a boy, then a girl, then a boy, then a girl. Um, so I think a lot of people have uh, what I am kind of terming like myopic views of sexuality, as in like short-sighted. So they can only kind of see people in the present moment of, you know, their partner that they have, you know, at this particular moment in time. But instead instead of kind of taking the, the sort of present view, we should look at um, something that happens over the life course, which has its own problems as well. Like it's, um, it's perhaps more difficult with younger people or people who haven't had that many relationships, but it does go some way to rendering bisexuality as something that's enduring and isn't like a phase or whatever. Um, so now I'm gonna kind of introduce my, um, what I kind of believe to be a kind of more complicated view of visibility, which is um, bisexual camouflage, as I put it, or identity camouflage. I kind of this is still quite a work in progress, so I'm very open to uh, people's. Uh, I'm really keen to hear your thoughts about this. But um, if we think about camouflage and visibility, um, camouflage is something that protects somebody from the vulnerability of being seen but it's also something that allows you to uh, like come out of the woodwork as it were and negotiate and you're able to choose who sees you at which particular point in time. Um, camouflage is also not, um, it's not 
being completely invisible, so it's imperfect, um, and it can aid you to a point that maybe sexuality is detected, um, maybe read imperfectly as well. So somebody might, um, somebody who's bisexual might be read as like gay or straight, as we've talked about before. But um, if we instead view, if we go beyond the kind of narratives of like passing and invisibility, we can talk about visibility as strategic, multifaceted, like complicated and context dependent. And this is kind of largely supported in my data. So pretty much everyone I spoke to, so I had 27 participants in the end. And um, only one of those did not identify as bisexual or pansexual. Um, nobody was just uniformly out as as their sexual identity so nobody was just like out to every everyone i kind of was talking to people about who they sort of trusted and it's a very conscious decision to uh, make yourself seen as bisexual um or as like queer more broadly and i think if we think about visibility as something that is kind of strategically employed um, to protect oneself, um, but also as people who are like, who have a lot of agency, um, who can choose to make themselves visible. I think this kind of um, it goes a better way to explaining, um, you know, uh, bisexual visibility in general. So, um, yeah, that's my presentation. Um, there are my references, and there's just been published, I literally only read it today, uh, Rosie Nelson's article um, about uh, uh, bisexual visibility, and that incorporates a, a, a really, really good analysis of gender within that as well, and talks about trans and non-binary visibility in addition to that. So yeah, thanks very much. Fantastic. Um, so, I have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> um, so, sexual sexual camouflage is that your term, or is that from somewhere? Yeah, no, that's something I came up with. So. Oh, that's a fantastic term. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you, ha, have you seen that? I, I mean, I've I've heard my gay friends, my gay male friends, specifically ones who work abroad, talking about how they sort of intentionally dress to pass, for example. Mm. Um, what what's the sort of basically my question here is how much is this a bi thing and how much is this this just a thing for gay people for home for, for queer people i think it's like that's that's one of the things i quite like about the the concept i think it is a queer thing really um and it is something that is a broad i i think it's something that bi people have to think about maybe a little bit more often but I think it's, um, I think it is a, like a kind of broadly queer experience to have to constantly sort of, um, the, um, the article that I linked to at the end of the presentation um, uh, is really good and talks about like queer coding and how people code themselves as queer um, within, um, with like how they m like mark themselves with their clothing and with their expressions and things like that. And that it goes into a lot more detail than I. This is just kind of like a um, uh, part of a chapter of my thesis that I'm trying to put together. So yeah, it's very, very early. It's kind of like rough sketches of things, but I'm glad it kind of has some sort of like resonance with people anyway. Yeah. So is that the concept of say secret signals? So sort of the handkerchief code kind of idea? Yeah, yeah, it's, um, but it's it's more, because that's that's more about like subcultures, but um, yeah, fair. Yeah, uh, the handkerchief code, and um, so yeah, it's more about how people like um, uh, like dress themselves and how they like demarcate themselves as queer, um, and how they are like um, able to be like read as queer by other queer people, um, and but also more broadly than that. So it's about how that you sort of like represent yourself within just like everyday life and in, in society as well as a kind of okay. means of uh, like gendered and sexual expression. 
So when you don't want to camouflage, when you, or, or do you mean when you want to be out to fellow queer people, but invisible to potential enemies? Well, that's the thing as well is, um, yeah, uh, a lot of the, a lot of the data I have. So I, I was kind of talking more about uh, Rosie's article there, but a lot of the data I have is kind of, um, is people having conversations with their families and they're being able to sort of read like reading the room is, is is sort of is really really important and to know how you and to be able to know how you're going to be understood if you do like open like say that you're bi is you do mm -hmm. come out as bi um and i think some people have really struggled with that um it, and it's not even in like traditional sort of um you know very uh what we might think of as like as like traditionally homophobic like family dynamics it's often within um like quite people who have like quite liberal parents for example um who will just say things which clearly um which clearly make it uh plain that they don't really understand what bisexuality is um and i think in uh, my data and in loads of other people's data as well um there's a tendency there's like the burden of ed of education like um terry one of my participants talks about that a lot of like his um like his mother like um being kind of very clued up and having lots of gay friends but look like an education about what like, bisexuality means and that it doesn't just mean like a transitional stage um fr from you know from straight to gay um and it's just really and you know the the burden of having to educate uh the people that you care about into understanding who you are is is you know is is something that is queer um more broadly and is just like just really draining as well i think it's just like it's just a really it is a burdensome thing to have to do interesting i think you also had a question in the comments oh, yes. from derek maybe um well yeah uh so it's uh derek says do you detect a trend in sexual camouflage that might take place over the next say 10 years uh i think um hopefully although i'm it, it depends it depends how things are going because like politically speaking we're in, sort of in the middle of a big right-wing backlash against you know a lot of progressive things that happened kind of starting in the late 90s i suppose um and it's really this is kind of the the like historian in me really and it's it's difficult to say about what's going to happen really because ideally you know things would be becoming more understood and i think there is a gen there there is a general you know there is more of an awareness about bisexuality um than there was you know even even in like um you know the kind of like birth of lesbian and gay studies and queer theory um and hopefully people won't have to sexual camouflage so much but i think it's so um um i think it's just so like written into lived experience as a queer person that you everyone kind of has these you kind of develop these skills and these strategies and you don't even really realize that you're doing it until you're kind of doing it so it's um it's this kind of like almost like an unconscious pro process but um of you know constantly having to present yourself one way or just being careful about how you present yourself as well that can be really difficult mm -hmm. um is there a key researcher that everyone should know on the topic of bi men? Um, <laughs> so sexual camouflage, I guess I, I was also wondering, um, Jacob, how, in terms of sort of visual manifestation of sexual camouflage, I feel like this is a really big theme in film, sort of passing in certain spaces and then specifically trying not to pass in others. Um, do you have anything that maybe ties in with Sam's work here? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, I've I've written down some kind of questions that were that were raised for me um, around around 
are signifying bisexuality because that's that's kind of the the trouble the um the trouble there is that oh. in the kind of signs that we are used to that denote sexuality um are kind of um dominated by images of lesbianness and gayness and potentially transness um but one of the difficulties with bisexuality is that outside of non-monogamy there are very few images or signs that we have um that convey bisexuality so my question to sam was going to be in your participants did you find any um people who had kind of strategies for actually signifying bisexuality um or was it more experiences of kind of um strategic uh appearances um within um existing signs yeah so uh on the kind of first point that i think having a flag and having a recognizable flag is super important um uh of you know, of a of something uh, as a visual symbol which represents bisexuality, um, and my one of my participants, um, or one of the participants, I should say. Yeah, you know, they're not all like you know, if you don't own them or anything. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, they had a um, they had a like a necklace which had a which had a, a bi which had a bi flag on it and they wore it in work. And that was, that was like important to them because they were in a, like a kind of management level position in an organization. And they s talked quite a lot about how important it was for somebody who was in a more senior role to be able to reflect diversity of the general workforce. Um, so that that's, but also that was important for, um, for them as part of their like professional identity. Um, but there was also like another example with Terry, who's one of the participants who I included, who um, very, very subtly um, posted a picture on Instagram. Um, and he showed me the picture um, of uh, saying, uh, it was a picture of like a, somebody holding a bi flag at Pride. And um, he just commented, oh, this is my favorite kind of flag. But, um, <laughs> uh, it's like having having an actual symbol which represents bisexuality is like really really important but i agree that um the kind of the actual kind of day-to-day -day side of like interacting with other people and telling them that you're bisexual and you know you get this kind of thing which is like supported in the data as well it's like oh but you've you've had like you know you've had like four boyfriends or whatever then like how can you be bisexual you know it's uh you know it like what are you actually expecting people to do like literally just have you know a, a girl and a boy then a girl then a boy like what um you know so, like social representations i suppose of bisexuality are really really difficult without like outside of um you know outside of uh like polyamory i suppose but it's 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 a like it's kind of an open question it's you know it's a it's a difficult thing and it's um yeah it's that's that's why i'm so interested in your work okay, okay. it's that it's uh it's like super interesting to um to think about that yeah no i'm i'm remembering a comment that my mom said to me when i was dating a man and woman at the same time it was something along the lines of like you're you're like the perfect bisexual or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> As if, like, everything else had been like an imitation of that or that, like not quite enough. Um, yeah. One, one other thing that came um, into my mind was a chapter by Claire Hemmings called Resituating the Bisexual Body. I don't mm. know if you, if you know it. Um, I, uh, I have only read Bisexual Spaces by Claire Hemmings and I know she has another book and I haven't read it and um, it was actually one of these presentations that uh, I was like oh no there's another book by Claire Hemmings and I haven't read it and I love Claire Hemmings and yeah it's a I think it's a chapter in a collection um, I mm. can't I remember which collection it is but she talks about the heterosexual matrix and mm. about the bisexual being in excess of the heterosexual matrix and that might be quite useful for you to um to work Thanks, yeah I'll make a note 
Um, I've got a PDF of it that I could send if you want. <laughs> Thank you. I would love that. Cheers. That makes a, I love the, the vocabulary around bisexuality as being just a bit too much. <laughs> um, are there any, I mean, I'm just thinking to sort of queer representation symbols. I mean, there's, there's flags and there are sort of the, like different organizations. So like there's triangles, there's the sort of so the pink triangle, for example, for queer culture, um, specifically for gay people. Um, then there's um, sort of different bi organizations that have their own logos. Is there any, even within gay culture, are there any sort of really clear symbols? I'm trying to think. I mean, maybe I don't know them because I'm not because I'm not gay. Um, but is it is has there are there any good examples basically of clear symbols where you're signaling to an in group but you're not signaling to an out group that you are part of X X sexuality? Mm, I don't know. Really, to be honest. Anyone? The first thing that came to mind was um, butchness and butch women. Um, get read as as lesbian um yeah certain codes around that and the kind of yeah that that kind of and i guess femme men right yeah in a similar way to femme men i suppose yeah yeah but but there's no actual i mean so that's sort of a, a style of dress it's more sort of a general presentation but does that include any specific like, we I, I almost want there to be just like a, a, a like a ring or a color and then like if you wear that it's a really good chance <laughs> it used to be black rings on the on the um, little finger for lesbians at least in the my my mom's a lesbian and in the 80s she said they wore black rings on their little finger really yeah. Yeah. i don't know if See, that's, that's really useful but also as soon as someone cracks that code potentially dangerous i guess sure yeah yeah. Just wondering. So I just thought maybe that you know something that I don't. Um, Sam, are there any researchers we should be paying particular attention to, besides you, of course, um, who are doing research on bi plus men? Or is that is it just like who, who should we be reading? There's a big book called The Changing Dynamics of Bisexual Men's Lives by um, Eric Anderson and Mark McCormick. And that's probably okay. the largest empirical study of, I think they had like 90 participants um, of, uh, of bi men specifically. Um, okay. So that has lots of empirical data. But um, part of the reason I'm doing my PhD is because I had some problems with it. Um, and I found the, um, the discourse a bit rosy on... Uh, on how everything was just, I don't know, it was a bit like, uh, you know, things just keep getting better and better and better and better. Um, and it just kind of didn't make, uh, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense in terms of, um, oh, hi. Uh, uh, hi guys. Uh, we're recording hi. by the way, also, ah. just, let, just letting you know. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, and yeah, it's kind of what I was talking with, Derek about in that, um, you know, things like Brexit and Donald Trump have happened, um, and <laughs> there's uh, there's been a dramatic shift in politics since, um, well, since 2016, basically, um, and I think that's had a real impact on, um, on a lot of queer people's lives, and I I don't think history works in the way that everything just gets better and better and better i think you know it's like peaks and troughs really um uh, i have a question considering camouflaging on workspace mm -hmm. uh do your participants have any experience in um, camouflaging in workspace and are there differences in the kind of work maybe uh blue color work or white color work and that are there are differences in uh, camouflaging yeah so um there uh um one of the participants i was talking about before who had this like um or who has this uh, management position um had kind of gone on a bit of a journey with um with you know the 
like wearing a wearing a, a like a bi necklace um a necklace with a bi flag on it was like the kind of pretty much like a, a the end point in a journey of like being able to um of like re really not being sure about how um what the place of um visibility was as a queer person within the workspace um i would say that they had pretty um they previously previously held pretty conservative views on that of keeping this kind of like personal and professional life separate um and i think that's something i have also done or attempted to do um turns out unsuccessfully but that's a, another story for another time um within uh particular workplaces that i've been in um there was uh terry my participant who was talking about um uh they work as a nurse he works as a nurse and he was talking about how he's often um presumed to be gay because he's in uh, the nursing profession and to um it's complicated i yeah because i don't have the the data hand but it was it was like a complicated professional uh professional thing you know to be working um as as like a as a male nurse um who's who's bisexual and um yeah they were talking about how that wasn't necessarily um you know they might have been read in a particular way um and that was uh I don't know, not not necessarily the worst thing, but yeah. So I'm not explaining myself very well because I'm trying to remember the data, but there's quite a lot of data I have to remember. But um yeah, work is work is an interesting thing, you know. It's an interesting um place. It's a kind of a, quite an unnatural place. Often workplaces can be, I think. Um, like particularly like office work as well. It's a very very strange like social situation that people find themselves in and represent like struggling to represent yourself um you know without um like like being free to represent yourself um in a way that you believe is authentic can be like a can be a real struggle for a lot of bi people as well um uh surya munro has written about this in one of her chapters of uh, book on uh, bisexuality. That's that's really good. I would recommend reading that. But, yeah, if you can get a hold of a copy. Great. Um, hi, Ursula. <laughs> do you have any questions about bi plus men? I know you missed the presentation, um, but do you have any questions for Sam specifically that you think um, you'd want to know about passing or camouflaging or other things? Um, no, at the moment, I don't think so. I'm so, I'm so sorry. I, um, I missed the whole thing. I, I was trying to listen in on my way home and then Zoom wasn't working on my mobile. So, um, yeah, I'm really sorry, but, um, no, no I'd love to chat to you about it afterwards or something, Sam. Sure. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Uh, I'll stop the recording if that's okay. If that's everyone's questions. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you everyone. <laughs>